Hello. Um, <coughs> I thought I'd say a few things um, in lieu of last uh, week's class that um, got canceled because of the snowstorm. Um, just to kind of encapsulate some thoughts on the subject of the um, of the class, which was we're st we were still looking at identities as we will this week, um, but focusing on women and LGBT Q two plus um, identities, more of some and less of the other. Um, I guess I'll start by saying some very brief um, things about uh, some works by gay artists um, and then spend most of the um, of my video today talking about women artists and, and some of the complexities that we see there. Um, we so I think we I was going to circle around well there's really not much point in circling around on the work of Richard Richard. Attila Lucas, um, because we looked at him, the pre looked at some of his works the previous week, um, but it's worth comparing his works with somebody that we hadn't seen before called Evergon. Evergon is a photographer um, who lives in Montreal, works out of Montreal, and he has a really um, rich website. He's uh, um, had a really rich career with um, that has been devoted to um, gay subjects um, and I guess I would say hom homoeroticism and I think it's really worth um, taking a look at it um, it's it is homoerotic that's your that's a warning there but um, it's worth thinking about and comparing with the work of Lucas or Lucats. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, because we see two very different um, visions of the gay subject um, that are worth comparing and would, by the way, make a great essay topic. Um, I think we talked about um, in two classes ago with Luca, Lucas, um, the his works are really quite subver or his subjects are quite subversive. We see um, really almost like a stereotype of a skinhead kind of body, very muscular. Um, I think I compared them with uh, the bodies of Michelangelo. I'm not the first person to do that, uh, but um, we had the sense that they were really dangerous and threatening. Um, not necessarily a, a loving vibe from his um, quite sizable panels, um, but they juxtapose, I think, in that way quite strongly with um, with the, f the photos of Evergon, who which are quite a bit more playful. Uh, we have moments of tenderness. Um, there's a much stronger sense of the theater of and, and of even camp. Um, his subjects are dressing up. They're wearing um, masks, uh, not necessarily to disguise and to haunt us or taunt us, but um, to, you know, in a, a playful sense. Um, so I, I think that, um, and we also, I guess I wanted to say too, they, they, we have a range in body types with Evergon. There's a range of ages, um, weights, uh, and and that's quite quite different from um, the figures that we see in the paintings by Richard Attila Lucas. So, um, having said that, um, I would really like to focus on talking about the depiction of women by Canadian artists um, and. I have a number of examples that I uh, included on our syllabus. Um, the first uh, two um, artists, or yeah, I'll say artists, um, there was a work uh, from the year 2000, which is called the Famous Five Monument, which is in Ottawa. It's a bronze uh, memorial uh, to five 
Alberta women who were famous. Uh, they were suffragettes. They were they um, petitioned um, earlier in the last century to have women classified as persons. It's hard to believe that um, in the eyes of the Canadian law, women were not considered persons. And I think the purpose of that was so that they could, uh, some of them wanted to become a senator um, or participate in political life. In any case, um, somebody somewhere decided that a monument should be raised in downtown Ottawa. And so that uh, bronze figurative group was um, installed. It's by Barbara Peterson. Um, and like I said, it dates from the year 2000. Now, something interesting that, that um, I thought worthwhile uh, considering, I, I was interested in what monuments of other suffragettes or suffragette suffragist movements um, looked like. Of course, I knew full well that um, uh, that movement was primarily um, primarily took place in England and in the U.S. Actually, all over the world. Um, anyways, I, I was curious about what other whether there were monuments anywhere else and what they might look like. And it turns out there's a Wikipedia page. It's called a list of monuments and memorials to women's suffrage. And that's a really interesting resource to compare or to situate the work in Ottawa with. Um, I would say, I think you, you all know that I'm also a critic and I would also um, really raise the question of um, how novel that monument is. It's a great, it's a great um, thing to memorialize their contribution to uh, Canadian life, to women's life. Um, but in terms of the actual choice of artistic, uh, the, the mode of representation, I would argue that the work is actually quite conventional. Um, so I would like you to, or I'd encourage you to have a look at, um, at those other monuments that are simply that are close to us south of the border in the US or in England all over the world really wherever there were women fighting for uh, women's women's votes women's rights in that vein um, it's also worth raising the question of Helen McNichol I don't know if you had a chance to watch the video about her um, that was on YouTube. I think there was a link to it in our textbook under the chapter called Abroad, um, where the speaker, I don't have a um, note of the name of the speaker, but um, she sort of did a good job of uh, presenting the life of this artist. Well, was she a Canadian artist? She was born and raised in Toronto and Montreal. Um, she died very early at the age of 35, but spent most of her artistic life or artistic career uh, abroad in England, primarily. Um, she went to the Slade School of Art um, in, uh, I want to say that's in Oxford, not in London, but I could be wrong. Um, anyway, she uh, was a member of various professional um, societies here in Canada and she was celebrated to some extent but she was also considered un-Canadian and um, uh, her style was considered un-Canadian. She was uh, not rugged enough for a variety of reasons. Um, so so it definitely so the speaker definitely presented an interesting case study. Um, I think too it's worth uh, as I did before, looking at the actual work, um, I'm somebody that's all in favor of being judgmental um, and asking difficult questions. And for me, the, the work is really quite, um, as I said before, it's quite conventional. It's not pushing any boundaries. It's, um, yes, she's depicting uh, women at the beach, women, um, 
involved. She, the speaker argued women at work. I'm not sure. Uh, she's not exactly a, um, a, a supporting the proletariat there. Um, but um, in any case, it, it's not uh, boundary pushing stuff. So we have to kind of distinguish between artists who are women and artists who identify as feminists. That's the kind of um, the axis upon which maybe the artists, the, the artists that I chose for this, um, for this uh, particular week, for last week, um, that, that there's a difference. And I think the next person that um, it really is a good example of that is Joyce Wheland. Uh, there was a video, again, um, embedded in the textbook. It was somebody called um, Joanne Sloan speaking about her, just a half an hour lecture that I thought gave a nice um, overview of Joyce Wheland's work um, that was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot of new things. And, um, you know, really, you, you come to appreciate what a multidisciplinary artist she was. Um, she worked in a variety of media. She was um, definitely active um, in, oh, I don't know, like uh, the what used to be called the domestic arts. It's such a great term, isn't it? Domestic arts, embroidery, quilt making, um, mater maybe now they're called material arts. Um, but she was also a painter and a um, and a filmmaker. And uh, I guess I shouldn't make it sound like there's a hierarchy of those practices, but I think there definitely used to be. Um, anyways, um, she, as we heard in the uh, video, she was really quite uh, politically engaged. Uh, she'd lived in the U.S. for um, what sounds like about a, um, over 10 years in the 60s and early, or maybe it was just the 60s. Uh, when she was married to another pretty well-known Canadian, Michael Snow, who actually passed away recently. Um, anyway, she uh, really had a kind of a different um, twist to her work, to many of her works. Like I said, she was really quite politically engaged, um, advocating for making works, her work, her artwork, um, that uh, addressed race relations in the U.S. Um, uh, the encroachment of, of the U.S. military, um, the role of the Vietnam War or activities taking place in the Vietnam War, um, and uh, also kind of... Um, even apocalyptic um, ideas about uh, things going, everything going to hell in a handbasket. Um, so I think that that posture, at least what we saw in Whelan's work, that posture, that critical posture, really differentiated her from the two works that, that uh, preceded her in the class by Barbara Peterson and um, and Helen McNichol. Um, really this, this sense of irony, this sense of mocking things, um, like I said, is, is quite, a different, um, quite a different approach. Like I said, uh, the difference between artists who identify as women versus um, artists who are politically engaged as feminists. Um, apropos of mockery, and of irony. I think this is a good um, segue to talk a little bit about Miss General Idea. Now I think we have a, I seem to remember that we have a um, presentation about General Idea, which was an artist group um, located in uh, Toronto in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and Miss General Idea, they had a big um, kind of emphasis on theater and producing um, 
a variety of, of shows, but in the intermission, there would, this creature would come out um, that they called Miss General Idea. And she was a, I hope I get her pronouns right, I'm assuming she's a she. Miss General Idea was a um, character that emerged in the intermission of these uh, theatrical shows in Toronto. Um, that was an amalgamation of um, different elements from society, amalgamation that um, that was staged or created by different artists. The general idea would send out a packet to somebody, um, giving them instructions on what they can and can't do and how they should um, position themselves as a as this the new what is it 1973 Miss General Idea or 19 I think the first one was in 1971 but um, suffice it to say that Miss General Idea was always different and she always um, kind of worked both within and outside um, the beauty industry she was kind of uh, upholding and mocking the beauty industry, um, upholding and mocking a talent show, a beauty contest, and definitely kind of mocking um, gender norms and uh, cultural cliches. She was really a um, quite a marvelous contribution and and um, a phenomenon in the uh, Toronto art scene. It sounds like, I wish I, I'm not, I hadn't, I've never seen her in person, but um, anyways, uh, she sounded like quite a character. Um, continuing the theme of alter egos of, um, of artists, <coughs> maybe I could say as male artists, um, is Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. Now, Miss Chief, um, I'll call her, is the alter ego of Kent Monkman, who I'm hoping we're going to see um, in a couple of weeks in Toronto. Kent Monkman is a Cree artist. He has an exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum. And he has this alter ego who's very stylish and beautiful, svelte, slim, elegantly, or I would, I would even say provocatively dressed, um, who uh, frequently visits the events taking place in his paintings. Now his paintings de depict rather um, unpleasant uh, truths, uh, events that happened in uh, Canadian history, events that happened to um, not just his uh, Cree people, but um, a range of indigenous people, and they're almost always quite, uh, uh, quite um, shameful events uh, um, that happened, such as uh, the abduction of children, the ravaging of the earth, all the terrible things that um, settlers have done to uh, mess things up. Um, with with indigenous peoples, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle will often make an appearance. Like I said in his uh, tableau, um, she intervenes in altercations. Um, she uh, she's like a fairy godmother. Sometimes she helps helps out in certain situations where help is needed. Um, she's, she's uh, you know, like a fairy godmother. If you think about the fairy godmother in, uh, in Shrek, or I think she's called the, yeah, she's called the fairy godmother, Dana, Donna Fort, Fortuna. Um, anyway, that's who Miss Eagle Testicle is. Um, Miss Chief, sorry, Eagle Testicle. I love that mischief, Miss Chief. Um, so that's another kind of, uh, gender bender artist alter ego that, 
again, might um, be a nice comparison, wonderful topic for an essay, for example, to compare uh, the two alter egos, mischief, eagle testicle, um, with Miss uh, General Idea, two really prominent uh, art artist alter egos in Canadian art production. Um, okay, the last uh, things I'll say are about um, two uh, contemporary um, women artists who, um, they're both photographers primarily um, and have been um, using, playing around with photography or different uh, iterations of photography um, to explore issues connected with women and, um, and, and female identifying people. Um, the first is Susie Lake, um, who actually I was so lucky to take a course from her um, in, at Guelph, maybe like 30 years ago. Um, she's a really prominent um, Canadian photographer. She uh, is actually an American who came to live in the U.S. Um, as opposed to the next person I'll talk about who's, who's, the, who's a Canadian who went and worked in the U.S. No, did I say that right? Susie Lake is a American who came to live in Canada. Sorry. She taught at the University of Guelph for many years. Um, and what she um, was, where she was active, I guess you, you would call her a feminist artist. And she was really active in the genre of self-portraiture. She, I shouldn't say was, she probably still is. Um, but pro she has produced a body of work, which is really exceptional. It's internationally regarded. She exhibits around the world. She has works in amazing collections, both in Canada and abroad. Um, and if I had to encapsulate one, um, a theme that is quite uh, consistent in her work, it, it's this sense of entrapment, um, the sense of uh, restriction. And um, I think this really comes out quite uh, prominently in a, some um, works that I think you read an essay on called Choreographed Puppets from 76 to 77. Uh, she also has, there are many other series that she's done that um, capture this sense of um, entrapment, of uh, artificiality, of uh, gender norms that are imposed on women um, that uh, that are not liberating, that are not um, fulfilling, but like I said, are quite uh, restricting. And so we see this um, in works where she's playing around with, she's caking on makeup onto her face um, and uh, or tumbling down a set of stairs. Um, in the choreographed puppets, um, she has actually bound herself up in bondage and she's trying to move around uh, a wooden set that is, uh, you know, just totally restricting. And she looks like a insect in a bell jar, flipping around, twisting, trying to escape, but not managing to. I, I find them really um, moving works. Um, her A more recent series that I think uh, tackles the same subject in a similar way um, is, a, is called Reduced Performing. And pr Reduced Performing Breathing. Maybe there's a comma in there. And... Um, <coughs> <clears throat> These are a series of uh, self-portraits um, that depict her lying down. It's a full body, perfectly life-sized um, photograph, co full color photograph print. Um, and she's just lying down um, 
we might say, can I say uh, passively? She's not out uh, fighting or struggling like um, like she did in the choreographed puppets war series. Um, I don't think she's. I don't. I wouldn't call it a passive subject. She's still looking directly at the viewer. Um, she's still engaging the viewer, and the title I think speaks volumes about a reduced performing. She's still she claims she's still performing um, and of course breathing she's you know it's almost like she's gone into a zen state or she's entering a zen state where the breathing is really quite uh, quite important um, actually I think the more I think about it there, there are multiple readings in that series I'm sure there are multiple essays that have been written about it but um, in any case, she's definitely um, a contemporary artist that uh, has thought a lot about the role of women in society or the roles of women in society and um, how she might capture that in her work. And I'm going to wrap up with um, a couple of comments about another photographer. Um, called Calla Thompson. She's actually a friend of mine. I went to school with her at the University of Ottawa and she's the person I mentioned uh, that's Canadian but ended up uh, moving to the US and, and working there. Um, I really would encourage you to check out her website um, and look at the body of work that she has produced. Um, she has worked in a range of media connected with photography, so digital photography. Um, she has uh, actually uh, done a lot of murals, like projected murals on gallery walls. She's done a mural on the steps of the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, she's done multimedia installations using lots and lots and lots of rhinestones. Um, she's really quite a um, multifarious artist. And her work, um, I'm going to actually go to her. I think the most telling um, uh, assessment of her work can be found in her artist statement, which is on her web. Her website, by the way, is Thompson Calla. And um, her art, artist statement reads, my works are a critical visual examination of contemporary culture. They are a means to investigate material greed and consumption, hostility, and how we exchange power in society. Wow. They examine an ongoing desire for civility and permanence while considering instability and loss. What a huge umbrella statement that is. I mean, it's just a few sentences, but um, it's really quite uh, impactful. And of course, it um, connects with everybody. And, uh, you know, thinking about material greed and consumption, um, how we exchange power in society. I can't help thinking that um, these themes, since I know her personally, um, were really exacerbated since moving to the U.S. Um, you know, it's it's quite a, obviously it's quite a obviously we're on the same continent as our American cousins, but um, the societies are really quite different, and the fact that she has um, really honed in on material greed and consumption and the exchange of power is um, really quite a um, intense, uh, I, I don't know, I think it, it relates really um, intense, intensively to um, life in America. Um, Kala um, <laughs> has in her works takes on a number of personae, persona, personas, I think it's personae with an A-E at the end. Um, and she, if you, if you um, 
scroll through her works, you'll see that there are really a number of um, characters that she embodies, um, that she occupies, that I think most people would agree belong to the patriarchy. Uh, male subjects, she presents herself as um, a woodsman in a balaclava. She presents herself um, as a, sometimes we see her in the guise of a medical doctor um, in uh, medical gowns. Um, we see her as a miner, M-I-N-E-R. Maybe in a, I can't help thinking that's um, a response to Trumpism. Uh, we see her um, in sort of military garb, holding uh, clubs um, and, and uh, quasi uh, weapons. Um, we see her as a hunter or um, as a, a protester. There's a wonderful, wonderful series with it with a that's actually quite um, horizontal, produced in uh, with digital photography. Um, that um, that uh, kind of embodies the all the protests of the last few years, and and I see her a little character of her as a photographer watching as an outsider. Um, her um, yeah, so we see her. She she plays a role both as. Um, in silhouettes, in uh, oh, in different kinds of shadowy drawings, um, and uh, she's um, ensnared in some kind of system of violence in various hegemonies, you know, systems of power, where everyday people are kind of trying to resist, or she's she's um, adopting kind of gestures of resistance. Um, and trying to fight back um, against the, I almost said microaggressions, that's not the right, they're almost like, I guess I would say macroaggressions um, that are um, featured in her work. Um, I think it's, uh, I think she has really quite a powerful aesthetic um, and, uh, you know, it. all of the themes in her work address women or others, people that are particularly in the U.S. that are um, victims of to toxic masculinity and of uh, patriarchy in general. Okay, I think I've um, said all I wanted to say about last week. I'm sorry that the class had to be canceled. Um, I hope you can check out, or I hope you did check out some of the resources that I mentioned um, in my talk today, and I hope that you, um, and I hopefully I'll see you uh, this week on Wednesday. Have a great day. Bye-bye.